Welcome to Metaphysical Soul Speak. I'm your host, Elena Fox Starks. Hey guys, hope you are doing well. I'm getting this out about an hour late, so up front, I would like to apologize. I've been taking care of my son a little bit. He's a teenager, so for the most part, takes care of himself, but he's a little sick today. And I slept like 10 hours. I you know, maybe 12 and I didn't wake up till 555 <laughs> on the nose in the evening. Just my eyes are bright red. I thought, boy, maybe I have Ebola or something. <laughs> I look like I've been smoking weed and I haven't. I've just been sleeping and it's been for three days like this with the eyes. So I'm wondering if uh, this isn't an ascension symptom or maybe I just have a virus. I don't know. But uh, following the wake of the uh, burning of the cathedral, Notre Dame, uh, I decided to do a show tonight on some of the relics that were inside. And I decided to focus on St. Genevieve. So that's coming up after the, after the little break. But before we get to it, I wanted to mention the ascension scale, the symptom level that we're at today as a collective whole has been 99 out of a possible 100. When we reach 100, though, we don't really have symptoms anymore. We have ascended. So this has been massive, like four or five days like this. Um, I'm going to read to you right now what the scientist said about the Schumann resonance. They wrote, the peak of today's graph has reached around 30 Hertz and occurred at 20 UTC yesterday. The rest of the graph shows continuous movements at 15 to 20 Hertz. Now for the previous two months on each the 17th, the Q letter of the alphabet I don't know why they do that, but I guess that's their own thing. Remember a few days ago, I said the Q and I'm like, what is he talking about? What is he smoking? I get it. So 17th is the date of the month, but for whatever reason, he's calling it the Q day of the month or because the letter Q is the 17th letter in the um, um, English alphabet. I don't know. That was just too weird. But anyway, (laughs) for the previous two months on each 17th, the Q letter of the alphabet, we had massive activity and led someone to saying that the SR could be influenced in some ways. So let's see if this pattern will continue tomorrow. Well, by the time you guys hear this, it will be the 17th. So we'll see. I'm hoping I'm hoping that we do have another 24 hours of white out (laughs) on the Schumann Resonance. I think it's raising our vibration and uh, helping us ascend farther, faster into the fifth dimension. I think it was pretty cool. So hopefully. Now, on the 18th, so the day after tomorrow will be an almost full moon and that will be the pink moon it's known as the pink moon of April because during this full moon is when in certain parts of North America the beautiful wildflowers that are pink start to bloom automatically and this is Native American tribes notice this so it's known as the pink moon not that the moon itself is pink but that that's when the flowers of that color are blooming. So basically on the 19th, there will be a pink moon or just a normal moon. That's a full moon known as the pink moon. So starting, I believe it was today on through the 25th, please look to the skies. If you wish to see the Lyrids media meteor showers, That is going to be amazing. I believe it was 20 per hour are expected. 
So, you know, you might want to go outside and look up (laughs) at night and enjoy that. So, as far as the Notre Dame is concerned, the Notre Dame Cathedral, it took nine hours to put the blaze out. The UNESCO Heritage Foundation has come forward and said they are going to do everything they can to help the spire be rebuilt. The spire burned and collapsed in the fire. Early in the morning, my friend uh, Benjamin, who is uh, Parisian, he is French and he lives there, he wrote to me and sent me a picture that he took on his way to university. The spire had not collapsed yet. And he said, it practically looks the same, but I know different. And I could tell his heart is breaking, as is the hearts of everybody in Paris tonight. And I'm just going to ask for uh, extra love and prayers to be sent. Um, Energetically, spiritually speaking, this was a cleansing. Probably of just a lot of stuff that needed to be cleansed in Paris, including the French Revolution. A lot of energy is stuck, you know, stuck in the land. The land gets confused and in turn doesn't really serve the people and it stays stuck in a lower density. So fire is a form of cleansing as is water and air. So, you know, hopefully everything's going to be all right. But Benjamin told me it's going to take them 50 years to restore the cathedral. That was on the news in Paris this morning. Yesterday morning now, I guess. So, yeah. (laughs) Most of the relics were preserved. They um, weren't sure about some things, though. There was a piece of the Christ cross, the cross in which Jesus was Uh, crucified on I myself have touched this a piece of the cross that Jesus was crucified on when I was in Lima I guess they cut this up and sent it to various Catholic churches around the world to spread that message of hope and peace I touched it it felt real It felt real. There was definite a power there. I was alone in this church, in this little tiny chapel that was not actually Catholic. It was made by the people who were Catholic, but the Catholic church did not condone it. They just, the people built the church on their own in Lima. And it's next to um, where the bones of Santa Rosa of Lima lie and... St. Martin de Porres. There's like three or four saints in the church next door, which is Catholic, but right next to it wasn't. It was just built by the people. And I touched that. I touched it. I felt not supposed to touch it, but you know me. I don't really give a rat's ass about <laughs> about what people say or think. And it wasn't my touching it for two seconds wasn't going to hurt it. It was actually very... Um, oily it almost looked like it had been burned or something and it was very almost like maybe like it was blackened with oxen blood or something which is how they used to make pirate ships impermeable to um, impermeable to the sea water I don't know I don't know if it was real or not but I know I felt a good energy from it ironically because it's like the one moment of like the worst possible moments of a man's life It was taken by force. So, ironically, there was a good energy to it. But I think that it's possible that they do have what they say they've got. But there was also one nail used in the crucifixion and a piece of the Christ cross, along with the crown of thorns that was brought back to um, France by King Louis IX in 1238. Eight. Um, but in 1804, Napoleon preserved it by taking it out of Notre Dame and putting it in the National Library of Paris 
And two years later, on August 10th, it was returned back to the Notre Dame Cathedral. And um, also there were relics from St. Denis, also known as uh, Bishop Dionysus. He was the first bishop in Paris who was named a saint. He died in 258 AD, and I don't know if it's his hair or his bones. I I don't know what is up with the Catholic Church thinking it's cool when someone dies to just carve up their body and cast it to the four freaking winds, and then everyone goes ooh and ah over people's bones. To me, it seems a little bit like black magic, and it seems like very, very dark uh, rituals to me. It doesn't seem at all pious and holy and lovely and beautiful and of the light. But I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Is it beautiful and lovely and of the light? Like if I become a saint and I leave a perfectly preserved body, like, do you think it's okay that someone just comes along and carves me up and puts my little toe in China and my big toe in France and my head on an altar in freaking Peru? Like, is that normal? It just seems evil to me, just to be honest. But I have been in the presence of some relics in Peru, and I did feel a lovely, beautiful, amazing, almost like a glowing energy. I felt safe and protected, and I felt close to those people whose bones, you know, the, the those used to be their bones. So I don't know. It's extremely creepy and macabre. But I don't know. I mean, I'm not judging it one way or the other. It just feels weird to me. You know, when someone dies, you're supposed to enter their body into the ground and wish them well and allow them to rest in peace, not be unrestful in pieces around the world. But I don't know. I mean, if you guys have a different opinion that would help shed light on this insanity. I would love to hear it. It would be great to hear. (laughs) You send me a message at anchor.fm forward slash metaphysical and I'll, I'll play it on the air. (laughs) All right. I'm going to come right back after this message and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Notre Dame Cathedral and specifically I'm going to focus on Saint Genevieve because she is a very important saint. She was a real saint in my opinion and obviously in the opinion of the Catholic Church but she performed miracles and we're going to talk about some of that when we come back. Hey you, have you ever thought about having your own podcast like me? Was it even a New Year's resolution? For me it sure was, but as I've been looking into this for months, I was daunted. There's so many questions I had. When I was trying to get this off the ground, I was wondering, how do I record the episode? How do I get it across all the platforms? How do I get my podcast on Apple podcast when I don't even have an iPhone. How do I get it onto Spotify and all the other places? How do I get people to listen? And how do I make money from my podcast? How do I edit it? Oh my God. I I had all these questions and I was so confused until I discovered the simple, simple answer is anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. Best of all, it's 100% free, and it is ridiculously easy to use. And now Anchor can match you with great sponsors, too, so you can get paid to podcast. All you need to do is record it. You don't have to go out and look for people to advertise on your show they help you so basically what I like about podcasting is 
I don't have to have a video of myself. You don't know if my hair is dirty or if I'm still in my pajamas or even if I'm wearing makeup. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> and it's so easy. I could do this from the comfort of my own home in my living room using this amazing app right from my cell phone. So easy, right? So if you've always wanted to start your own podcast and make money, by the way, doing it, please go to anchor.fm forward slash start. That is anchor.fm slash start to join me and the diverse community of podcasters that are already using Anchor. Again, that's anchor.fm forward slash start. I can't wait to hear your podcast and I can't wait to favorite you. Woohoo! Let's be bro- let's be broadcast podcast buddies. <laughs> I'll see you there. Our Lady of Paris. Notre Dame in French means Our Lady. And they call the Notre Dame Cathedral Our Lady of Paris Cathedral. For Parisians, this is a point of honor and pride. And it's so massive, so enormous that it just the grandeur of this place makes one humble before the Lord. Or so, you know, I've read and been told by people who have been there. (laughs) Um, I don't know, just there's something really, really special about this place. It's not only a point of interest for people who are Catholic or Christian, but also people who really love old, old art and artifacts and gothic structures. Um, People who love architecture are in love with this place. I love architecture. This place, I've seen pictures and I'm just from inside and from various angles and I'm just absolutely in awe of this beautiful, beautiful building. Every year, 13 million people flock to Paris specifically to see this church, this cathedral. That averages to about 30,000 people per day. The church itself is 856 years old and it took 200 years to build it. After this fire that occurred yesterday, it took nine hours before the blaze was put out. Notre Dame Cathedral is like a huge museum of relics They have old bells. They have one bell called Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel in the Bible means God is with us. I don't know uh, why they named the bell Emmanuel, but they have many, many bells. And according to the news, uh, the bells were preserved. They have many, many, many pieces of art, absolutely beautiful pieces of art and From what I understand, most of the artwork was also preserved. Did take nine hours to get the blaze out, and most of what burned was the roof. Two thirds of the roof are is just gone. They were worried. There's several organs, or I think three giant uh, organs. Very famous. The biggest organ there, I think, is the biggest in the world. It has over 30 pipes. It's a pipe organ. Oh, I would love to hear this someday. Uh, (laughs) It sounds like it was an amazing sight and sound and just senses. All of your senses would be so um, entrenched 
and it seems like a glorious place to behold in every possible way of, of the word. The grand organ, uh, when the, the fire crews went in and they were spraying the place, the water went up onto a cement balcony and that made the water go to the right and the left of the grand organ. So thankfully the water did not get into the mechanisms or the pipes. They are hoping that the heat of the fire did not warp the sound of the pipes because that would be a lot to replace. But they think that the organ was preserved. The crown of thorns worn by Jesus was preserved. A very, very brave priest is being lauded as a hero today. He ran in to save the crown of thorns. He ran in with the firefighters and went immediately, grabbed the crown of thorns and ran out, fearless. So, Father Fournier today is a hero. The crown of thorns, as you recall, was worn by Jesus when he was crucified, and they made fun of him. They called him Christ, King of the Jews, and made fun of him, poked him and prodded him, and it was a horrible, horrible day for him, (laughs) obviously. So... Some of the relics... They're not sure. They're not sure about the piece of the cross that was preserved. It was brought from Rome by St. Helena, who was the mother of Emperor Constantine. She wanted to make sure that a piece of the cross was preserved in Paris. And she personally brought it and saw to it that this, along with one nail of the crucifixion, at least was preserved in Paris. These were kept in the spire that collapsed. Nobody has been able to get to these two things yet. Only in time will we know. <coughs> uh, let's see here. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, the tunic of St. Louis the Ninth. He was a king. In fact... He is the only king canonized as a saint by the Catholic Church in Paris. He led the Crusades, known as the Seventh Crusade, from 1248 to 1250. And he died in Algeria during that crusade. And he ruled in the 1200s. And he was canonized in 1297 by Pope Boniface, Boniface, which means beautiful face. (laughs) Um, Pope Boniface VIII was the one who canonized King Louis IX. And I guess he wore a tunic. (laughs) It looked like a really super comfortable robe. Well, that was also preserved, so that was safe. Um... Let's see what else. Uh, St. Dennis, also known as St. Dionysus or Bishop Dionysus. He was a bishop who died around 258 AD. He was the first bishop of Paris. And they had some relics from him, but it wasn't made clear. I looked on several websites and they just said some relics from St. Dennis. I don't know if it was like his hair or his bones. Either way, I think it might have been kept in the spire. It is unclear at this point whether or not those things survived the fire. Three of the rose windows that are absolutely famous for their magnificence and beauty were preserved in their fine. The famous organ, as I mentioned, was fine. And all of the statues of all of the apostles are fine. So it's pretty interesting, right? It's 
pretty interesting how the whole world will rally around when there's something massive like this. They didn't so much do this in Iraq, to be honest, when the war was going on and the relics were being stolen and destroyed. Those were some important, very important relics in Iraq. That is more towards the cradle of civilization, you know, than Paris. But nobody really rallied around it. I think people just didn't understand what was there. Nobody flocked to Iraq. Nobody flocks to the Middle East, really, you know, except for Muslims to go to Saudi Arabia, you know, to see the first house of worship built by God, the Kaaba. But Notre Dame is just, it's like in the heart of this city and everybody wants to go to the city of lights. Paris is an amazing place to be in France is a very unique and amazing, uh, country. I do hope someday to be there, to go there again. I've been there in past lives and I loved being there. But um, there's something really special about Notre Dame that makes people want to go. And now we can't for a while until they get a lot of it cleaned out. It did, though, uh, create good news for the Louvre. A lot of people are in the Louvre instead today. In fact, my friend Benjamin said, yeah, they've been jam-packed ever since the fire started. Everybody, all the tourists in town went, or, you know, in that beautiful city, not town, as a city. Everybody went to the Louvre instead. I told him if it was up to me for my camera crews, he said, oh, there were so many camera crews, you wouldn't believe it. At the Louvre, he walked by there, he couldn't believe it. I said, well, if it was up to me, I would have been saying, well, I think the best view is from inside uh, Disney Paris. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I love, I, I shouldn't love Disney stuff, but I do. God help me. And the Pirates of the Caribbean ride is always my favorite. So I have to go. <laughs> and it'd be fun to watch it in French. But anyway, back to the Notre Dame. So it got me interested in who has body parts there of the saints. And it got me very interested in the saints themselves when I started, you know, looking at the little news clips on, you know, various things on YouTube. I don't get normal news. I don't pay for cable. All I have is Netflix and YouTube. So, uh, it's kind of how I get my news. Um, and also online, just looking up stuff, reading articles, <laughs> the somewhat old fashioned way. <laughs> uh, okay. So the crown of thorns, by the way, was brought back. I think I did say that they brought back by King Louis, the ninth, the ninth in 1238. Um, I don't know if that's the reason why he became canonized or not. I didn't look into it, but I think there might've been miracles surrounded or surrounding, um, St. Louis. And also he, he led the crusades. So, you know, furthering the Catholic cause, <laughs> I guess is a, a reason to be canonized, huh? So I can't say for sure if he was a true saint and St. Dennis, I also didn't look into him much. Um, so I can't say one way or the other if he is or is not a true saint in my book. <laughs> but as I looked into St. Genevieve, now this is where things got very interesting for me. St. Genevieve. Well, first of all, when I heard this, I'm like, oh yeah, St. Genevieve. Oh, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> I grew up in a suburb of LA going to St. Genevieve's Catholic school. And that was my first church was St. Genevieve's. So I'm like, you know what? It's funny. After all these years, I never actually bothered to look into who St. Genevieve was and was she a true saint. And I'm here to report based on the stories I've read on many different websites. Yes. In Didi Bobber, St. <laughs> Genevieve was a true saint. 
She knew from a very, very young age when St. Germain, who was a bishop at the time, came through and spoke before the crowds in her little city of Nanterre, which is a little, um, kind of a little township just outside of Paris. He was speaking there, and in the middle of his speech, he stopped and he saw this little girl, and he just knew it. And he and he said, "Come, you know," and asked her parents to bring her. And he looked at her and he asked her, "Would you like to serve God for the rest of your life?" And she said, "Yes, of course." And he goes, "I see you, and I recognize that in you." And she said, you know, like, yeah, you know, maybe help me. And and he's like, I will always help you. And he asked her several other questions and told her that she should basically spend her days and nights, any moment she can, just praying, maybe fasting, doing whatever it takes to give herself to God and to not ever be touched by a man. So she became what is known as a perpetual virgin. She never dated or anything. And she went to the church at an extremely young age, like around eight or nine. So when she was around 15 or 16, she then donned the nun's habit and became like officially a nun in the Catholic Church. She was born in the year 422 AD and she became so fabulously famous for her deeds that even a Celtic cult in ancient times cropped up around St. Genevieve. She was a very, very special person. So it was in 14, I mean, in 429, roughly, which I guess she was seven years old, actually, is when St. Germain had gone to speak. And he was there to speak against Pelagianism, which is basically people who don't believe in original sin and who, you know, in original sin, if you're not Catholic or Christian, is when you're born because you're born of um, Adam and Eve and Eve ate the apple and they were cast out of the garden that everybody has that original sin on their record and they must work their whole life to get rid of it or maybe you get baptized and then you're rid of it and then the rest of your life you have to stay keep your nose clean so you could get to heaven I myself do not believe in original sin I think that's ridiculous you know I just don't, I just don't. (laughs) I'm guilty of Pelagianism, I guess. Um, And there's Christian grace is another thing that I guess if you're a Christian, then you have a grace with God, you know, almost like an automatic in. I also don't believe in that. (laughs) I think that there have been a lot of wonderful atheists in the world that are definitely getting into heaven. Um, There might not be the heaven that we imagine. It'd be a heaven that atheists create. You know, we, we go to where we believe we belong. But, um, yeah, I don't believe just because you're Christian, (laughs) you're automatically spared. And now you, you know, I don't know. (laughs) I think it's each according to his deeds, but I think that overall the majority of us do actually go to heaven and then we get to come back here and, you know, you know, me and reincarnation, but So he basically just, he recognized this child as being pure of heart. And she came here specifically to serve God. And when he asked her, she said, oh yes, that's why I'm here. She knew it too. And she died in, um, well, 89 years later, she was 89 years old when she died. And some of the things that I've read about her, she was an incredible person. First of all, she until the age of 50 only ate meals on Sundays and on Thursdays she ate twice a week and when she did eat it was just like barley bread 
<laughs> and rice. She never drank anything except for water her whole life. And that and only ate twice a week until she was 50 years old when one of the visiting bishops came and said, look, you, you have to eat better than this. And when at the age of 50, she added fish and milk to her diet and, and still ate very little, but ate a little bit more often than two days a week. St. Genevieve was incredibly special specifically to Paris and Parisians because she had a second sight. She was psychic. This is a gift by God and she could see the future. And many times this, this helped people around her. And one time in particular, this helped all of Paris. She saw that Attila the Hun was marching across the continent and she saw this barbarian coming into Paris. And the way that she decided to stop it is she basically gathered up as many people she could in 451, the year 451. And she said, look, I know you're ready to flee in terror, but let's not evacuate. If you keep your faith in God, if you pray and you fast and you perform your penance, our city is going to be protected by heaven and everybody's lives will be spared. Well, (laughs) Attila the Hun was Attila the Hun, right? The guy's vicious, horrible merciless warlord he left nothing but devastation in his wake and the soldiers you know raped looted killed destroyed they were marauders they were horrible very evil people so a lot of people stayed with Genevieve and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed in the in what is known as the baptistry and then later she took them to an outer part of the city on the other side of the city to help them, you know, be preserved, but said, please, you know, keep, uh, you know, just keep the faith, keep the faith, keep the faith. It's going to happen. But what happened was the people started to turn against her. They were panicking. They were like freaking out and they turned against her. They said, you're a false prophet. You're going to bring about the deaths of everyone in Paris and destruction of the city and they wanted to stone her (laughs) like literally that's killing somebody by throwing stones at them so Saint Germain intervened on her behalf and he was laying on his deathbed in Ravenna, Italy and he heard of this and he sent his archdeacon who whose name was Sedulius and Sedulius came over to Paris to calm everybody down. And he said, look, you have to listen to Genevieve. She knows what she's talking about. She's not, you know, a, a doomsday sayer or whatever, or like a prophetess that is false, but rather she is there for your salvation. You have to pray. Just keep your faith, pray, believe in her and be calm. Well, some people, of course, left Paris and said, yeah, right, (laughs) right, I'm leaving, get out of here. But St. Genevieve gathered women who remained behind and believed in her. And she led them outside the walls of the city. And this is what it says on encyclopedia.com. I'm going to read directly this quote. As the sun rose and with enemy weapons before them, Genevieve and the women prayed for deliverance. Later that night, Attila turned away from Paris, leaving the city unharmed, and headed south to Orleans. Genevieve was proclaimed a savior and a heroine. So, 
it was pretty cool, right? I mean, she just, she believed she had her faith in God and she believed 100% in her, like she didn't ever turn away from that. Now, when St. Genevieve was younger, she used to make many, many trips of charity to little cities. And while she was there, she experienced visions and she told people of prophecies that later came true. She performed many, many miracles. And even though everything was accurate and she was doing all this wonderful work for in the name of God while she's living with her godmother um all the neighbors started to just have like jealousy and hatred and they start calling her a uh, fraud and a hypocrite and at one point her enemies got so zealous in their hatred of poor Genevieve that they plotted to kill her by drowning. But St. Germain, <laughs> he saved her. He said he would always save her and help her. And he did. This time, he actually intervened on her behalf and was able to stop the conspiracy. He changed the attitudes of everybody around her with, with his visit. And... At this time, he told her she has to stop, you know, being so harsh on herself. She was doing penances and it was really, um, like detrimental to her health. And he told her he, she had to stop. And so she, she stopped or lessened it at least. But after that, the Bishop of Paris appointed Genevieve to protect the welfare of the virgins the young women and girls who were virgins in the city of Paris. And they wanted to dedicate their lives to God just like her. And so the prediction that St. Germain had made about her when she was seven years old, it came true that she was going to be in charge of inspiring a new generation of women and girls that wanted to only do the Lord's work and not live in the world, you know, such as marriage and kids and all of that. So it was true. He knew, he knew that that's what was going to happen. He saw it. He had a vision of that. So when seven year old Genevieve had met St. Germain, she asked him specifically for a blessing and he sanctified her immediately or sanctified by she was sanctified by heaven they say what does exactly that mean I don't know I think that means that God knew she was going to already be a saint and she came here for that purpose it was her life purpose and she was consecrated to the Lord by Saint Germain and he gave her a blessing and handed her a medal and he said don't ever wear silver or gold or other pieces of fancy jewelry. This is what you shall keep on your person at all times. And it was a little tiny gold cross, well, gold medal with a gold cross carved into it. He said, this keep on your person at all times and allow this to remind you every single moment of your life that you are dedicated to Christ. And she promised she would. And she wore it from that day forward every second until the moment of her death, actually. And when she was about 15 or 16 and became a nun, she moved in with her godmother because her parents had died. And she was known for her piety and her devotion and charitable works, and especially for praying. And every single night, she was always in the church praying all night long. And there's a a story that kind of maybe got a little bit out of hand, but she was praying in the church and she had a candle because it was the only light they had that she had at night. And um, a wind came through the window and blew out the candle. And she, 
to me it sounds like she was just like laughing and joking about it but she said that the devil had blown out her candle (laughs) to stop her from praying so now there's many many paintings of Saint Genevieve in which there's like a devil lurking in the background and she's holding a candle that's still lit (laughs) so I don't know there's always a lot of um you know, the art, it just kind of gets a little bit overzealous. I don't know if this is a true story that the actual devil blew out the candle or hello. It was just like normally the wind, you know, (laughs) but that is something that she is really well known by. Like if you ever see a picture of someone holding a candle, the devil in the background looking a little bit irked, that's definitely a picture of St. Genevieve. But she was known for her austerity. She was known as the patron saint of Paris because of averting the attack by Attila the Hun. But also there's another very interesting story about her. So there was the king of the Salion Franks and he was a pagan And I guess he wanted to start a war against Paris. And his name was King um, Childeric in 486. And he was um, the king of a Germanic tribe, is the Salian Franks. They were a Germanic tribe. So basically, they just felt like attacking (laughs) and blockaded the city of Paris. And at nighttime, while they blocked the Paris streets and people couldn't get in and out. What had happened, what had started to happen is that serious food shortages started to occur because the farmers couldn't get their grains into the heart of the city and the people of the city were starting to starve. (laughs) And she was scared that there was going to be like a massive famine. And at night, she just demonstrated her bravery. She took um, other people with her. They led out 11 boats onto the river and they rowed past the enemy's siege lines while the enemy slept. (laughs) And once she was safely across, she went begging, or maybe I think it was her alone. I think that's what it was. She was not with anyone. She did this on her, on her own. So basically she had like tied all the boats together and had 11 boats. And she, uh, rode by herself past the enemy lines. And when she was at safety, she went from village to village begging for food. And later that night she returned back to Paris while they still slept And she slipped in safely past the blockade and she had boatfuls, boatfuls of the precious grains that were needed to uh, preserve the people of the city. Now later, King Childeric heard about her good deed and found that to be extremely impressive of a woman to do, right? And he was a pagan and she was a Christian, but that didn't matter to him. He was just really admirable. Or I mean, really, I mean, admirai, ad, bleh. she was really admirable to him. He admired her for her bravery and her fortitude to be able to do that by herself. So he asked, I want to do a favor for you because that was incredible you know, what can I do to, you know, to help you? And she said, just please release your prisoners. The only, their only fault was that they so dearly loved their city. So he granted her wish and allowed them to go. And then he later performed other merciful acts when she requested them. (laughs) So after King Childeric died, um, the new king was named King Clovis and so he was also a pagan but he married um, the elder daughter of Childeric 
Clotilde, who was a Christian, apparently going against her father's wishes to remain pagans as a family, I guess. <laughs> but King Clovis had been regaled with many tales of the heroism, heroism and bravery of St. Genevieve, and he was really impressed with her. So he also did many favors for St. Genevieve, like releasing prisoners when she requested it. And she earned his trust. And in time, King Clovis asked Genevieve to be one of his advisors and counselors. And he had promised that he'd be baptized Christian if he came back alive from one of his I don't know, raids or whatever. And, well, his army did win, and he came back and in 1496 became a Christian. And he was guided in his current version by Genevieve. So, there's that. Um, eventually, all of his people and all of his servants became Christians at the behest of Genevieve. And it's only because of her bravery, right? You know, she was just influential, <laughs> But she wanted a church to honor St. Peter and St. Paul to be built. And so she kind of talked King Clovis into it, and he started the church. And he had laid the foundation for the church, but didn't finish the church because he died in the the year 511. But Queen Clotilde, the daughter of um, King Childeric, actually finished the church. And then when Genevieve died, her body was interred in the church. And later the church was renamed as St. Genevieve's. And then again, it was rebuilt in 1746 as it had been falling down. But the reason why I'm talking about St. Genevieve is that her teeth, not her body, but her teeth that were preserved were in the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Now, I did hear that for a time her um, body had been interred in the Church Etienne, and I don't know if that was the original name or not. Or she had been there for a while, and then her body had been... Or I don't know. I don't know. Or she was in that original church, and then they moved to Etienne. I don't know. I think this... Encyclopedia.com might know a little bit more than some of the other things I've seen. There's always conflictual information when it comes to uh, saints. And I don't know why, but it just seems like a lot of the stuff gets sullied because people are so overzealous. And it's almost like playing the game telephone. We have a long line. In fact, (laughs) when I went to St. Genevieve's Catholic school, when I was in grade school, I was eight years old. We had to sit as one of our activities in the hallway. It was like an indoor outdoor. It was like, it was like recess, but because it was a rainy day, we were in the hallway, which is an indoor outdoor, but we were not being rained on. And we had to sit in this long line and someone started a rumor at one end and they taught us how to play telephone. And I think that might've been an exercise in understanding how some of these stories about the saints get started. I think that the person who started this exercise that day knew that someday we would have to um, imagine that this is how these rumors get started. That we always have to take all these stories like with a grain of salt. So St. Genevieve, she died on January 3rd in the year 512. She was... 89 years old and she died only five weeks after the death of King Clovis. So they buried her in a long flowing white gown that's reminiscent of what the Virgin Mary would have worn. Obviously she gave birth. She wasn't a virgin after. (laughs) And she had actually other kids later according to other books other than the Bible. Actually, you know, it's kind of funny how some of these things get started. But 
It was uh, assumed that her burial site within the church would become a place of pilgrimage. And it's true. People go to visit her gravesite all the time. She is known for cures and miracles that have been attributed to her even after death. Much like in my um, episode I did on St. Francis and the people that followed him. <laughs> Remember that story? St. Francis had to go to the grave site of one of his followers and had to tell the, the guy's dead body to stop stop doing, performing miracles because they were trampling the land. <laughs> and it was making it really hard for like all the people in that area to grow crops. <laughs> it was causing a problem. So a lot of the saints not only perform miracles while they're alive, but after their death, the energy surrounding their bones, maybe their spirits, um, come back and grant miracles for people. So it's pretty cool. But one of the most amazing and most famous accounts of miracle after death was there was a problem with ergot poisoning that affects, um, I believe rye and or barley grain. I think it's rye and ergot poisons people in a way that it makes them hallucinate. It is a natural form of acid or LSD, lysergic acid. And it makes people go crazy and it can actually, I think it can actually kill people, but before they die, they have these wild and massive hallucinations. And it's been attributed um, as a, a potential cause for all of the witch hunt scares, people panicking and freaking out that there might have been mild cases of ergot in the food supply and that people didn't know what it was and didn't know that it existed. They just kind of all went crazy. Huh. And so it was a serious thing. It was is a very serious thing. So in 1129, this great epidemic of ergot poisoning afflicted all of France and no one can find a cure and people were really sick and the Bishop Stephen of Paris thought that the only thing that would help is if they took (laughs) the casket of St. Genevieve with her body inside and carried it through the city streets in a procession to the cathedral and the people came out to see this by the thousands and they all flocked to touch her casket. And as they touched her casket, they were made well and whole again. So Pope Innocent II visited Paris a year later after this miracle, this really huge miracle and ordered an annual feast to commemorate this and to this very day all the churches of Paris celebrate this feast (laughs) in which St. Genevieve's body cured thousands and thousands and thousands of people from the ergot poisoning sickness unfortunately during the French Revolution however uh, most of her relics were destroyed in the late 18th century. Her cult, her followers carried on, however, because she's not someone who is easily forgotten. And she has been known as a patron saint of Paris, as I said already. And there's many miracles that have occurred in the city of Paris and all the miracles are attributed to her. Her name has been invoked for people wanting her to intercede on their behalf, whether it was with widespread fevers that racked the city or floods or even droughts, any kind of natural disaster, her name is invoked. People absolutely love her. And she has also been known as the patron saint of young girls 
because she inspired so many young girls to follow in her footsteps and serve God and sacrifice all of the pleasures of life that most people want to grow up to experience in lieu of helping others. Also in 1962, as late as 1962, Pope John the 23rd did name her the patron saint of French security forces because he wanted to commemorate her in all of her efforts to secure the city of Paris. So her feast day, if you want to celebrate St. Genevieve is January 3rd, but you obviously can remember her any time of day or night <laughs> that you wish her emblem of course is uh, sometimes it's a candle with a devil in the background <laughs> which is so strange but that's it is what it is she saved the city from Attila the Hun by fasting and prayer she rescued the city with 11 boats and her emblem is a candle so if you uh Wish to remember this beautiful French nun, patroness of Paris. It's not hard. Just ask her to be with you and intercede on your behalf. Possibly if you've been poisoned also, right? <laughs> I hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Metaphysical Soul Speak and that you might invoke the name of St. Genevieve when you pray for the people of Paris tonight. And the per- Preservation Committee, <laughs> UNESCO has said that they're going to preserve the church, the Cathedral Notre Dame, will be preserved in its original form as they've already asked thousands of people to send in their pictures of every possible angle of this church. And they've already gotten so many that they know they're going to be able to perfectly preserve the spire the way that it used to be just a few days ago. So, uh, well, there it is. There you have it. The story of (laughs) the Cathedral Notre Dame and the patron saint of Paris. I am signing off now with peace and joy and the high vibes of the Holy Fifth Dimension. Until next time. Metaphysical Soul Speak is run on sponsors and listener support. This means listeners like you. If you are so inclined to support my efforts and my little podcast, please visit me at anchor.fm forward slash metaphysical and pledge an amount of your choosing today. Thank you.